Hello and welcome to session one of our second annual Completed Life Fall Conference. My name is Sarah Kiskadden Bechtel and I am the program director for the Completed Life Initiative and I will be your host today. At the Completed Life Initiative, we promote self-determination and dignity at the end of life. If you are new to our event programming, please feel free to explore our video archives on our website after today's event at www.completedlife.org. Our second annual conference examines core elements of medical aid in dying. What happens after legalization of assisted dying? How has the legislative landscape in the United States shifted over the past 30 years and where is it headed? What is the global significance of the right to die movement? Whether you are new to our completed life community or are a returning attendee, we invite you to attend each of our four conference sessions and come prepared to ask lots of questions. These sessions are invaluable learning tools meant to empower you to have an informed conversation for yourself and with your loved ones about the question, what does it mean to live a completed life? Today's session one focuses on what happens after aid in dying becomes legal. Medical aid in dying is legal in 11 jurisdictions in the United States, including the District of Columbia. Advocates know the often insurmountable odds of passing right to die legislation. Yet, what happens once the right to die is legal? Today, we will learn from expert scholars on the stories of assisted dying. Dr. Francis Norwood will present about lessons for the good life at the end of life in the Netherlands. And Dr. Mara Bookbinder will explore the stories of assisted dying in the United States. These stories represent the perspectives of patients, their families and caretakers, as well as healthcare attorneys and policymakers who now face what happens after the hard won battle for legalization. Today's session will explore exactly what challenges remain as well as seek insight on how to resolve them. A little background on our speakers. Dr. Mara Bookbinder is professor and vice chair of social medicine at UNC Chapel Hill as well as core faculty in the UNC Center for Bioethics. Dr. Bookbinder is a medical anthropologist with broad interests in, cultural, in cultures of health, illness, and medicine in the, in the United States. She's the author of Scripting Death, Stories of Assisted Dying in America, which was published by the University of California Press earlier this year. Her research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the Greenwall Foundation, and the Wenner Grand Foundation. Dr. Francis Norwood is Assistant Research Professor in the Department of Anthropology and in the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. With a PhD in Medical Anthropology from the University of California, San Francisco, and Berkeley, Dr. Norwood has 20 plus years experience conducting health policy research on innovations in home and community-based care, long-term care and end-of-life supports for persons who are elderly and persons living with disabilities. She is author of a number of articles on chaplaincy and end-of-life care and is recipient of the Margaret Mead Award for her book, The Maintenance of Life, out in, uh, published in 20, 2009 and recently in out in the second edition in 2020. Um, I'll put the, the link to more of uh, Professor Norwood's research activities in the chat. Before we begin, please be aware that you may input your questions into the chat feature located on the lower right hand corner of your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the event, and later on we will turn to your questions for an interactive Q&A with our esteemed panelists. We welcome your questions at any time throughout session one, um, and if you'd like assistance with closed captioning, you may turn on the toggle box uh, lo located on the lower left-hand corner of your screen that provides captioning for the spoken words of our event today. <clears throat> 
uh, and throughout today's event. Feel free to tag us in your social media posts and tweets. We are at completed life and hashtag completed life. And finally, one last note about logistics. We will be sharing a recording of today's event with you via email uh, after the conference concludes. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, uh, and without further ado, um, Dr. Norwood, please take us away. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'm going to share my screen if you don't mind. Um, Absolutely. And Sarah, I just want to uh, say thank you so much for inviting me to talk. Mara, I can't wait to hear more about your research. I've read about you for a while, so it's a pleasure um, to be on the same panel with you. Um, and everyone who's showing up today, thank you so much for listening. Um, it is my absolute favorite thing to do to talk to people who um, are living these choices. Um, and my work was intended when I uh, first did my research in the Netherlands uh, back in two, 1999, 2001. Uh, my purpose was to write a book that could certainly speak to the anthropology and the uh, you know, research that I was doing, but I wanted something that would speak to patients and families and um, people who were trying to make changes in this area, in addition to the academics and, and the researchers. So this is a book that I had intended for everyone. Every chapter starts with the story of somebody's lived experience, what they were going through, and then the chapter sort of breaks it out and tries to make, make sense of it from, um, uh, from an anthropological point of view. So I'm just excited to be able to tell you a little bit more about it. So let me move on to what my research was uh, originally about. So I spent about 15 months living in the Netherlands. I did learn Dutch for this because when somebody is not feeling well, I knew it was very important to be able to speak in their language, not mine. Um, but my fallback though was uh, the Dutch are usually very good at speaking multiple languages. So if I was gonna struggle a little bit, I knew that they would have some English to help back me up. But uh, all of my research was done in the Dutch language and uh, it was time spent with uh, predominantly with patients and their family members uh, in their home setting and um, and uh, hanging out with their, excuse me, their general practitioners and their home health team. So most of my day would start by uh, biking to, you know, uh, a small town either in Amsterdam or just outside. And um, I would spend the morning with the general practitioner and then at the end of the morning and then for most of the afternoon, we'd be visiting patients one after another in their home or in the nursing home setting. So that was the uh, setting for my research. Um, I am a qualitative researcher. So what I do is uh, I do participant observation, which mainly just means I hang out with people see what they're doing, and then we have some side discussions about what I think I'm understanding. And then I'm also doing uh, qualitative interviews. So those are usually semi-structured where I have a general plan of questions, you know, usually about eight to 10 questions I want to ask. And, uh, but I will go explore things off of those questions. So it's not like a survey uh, where it's a lot more structured. Um, so basically over my course of 15 months, uh, I'm, I, did intensive work with about 15 different practitioners. Half were in the city of Amsterdam, half were in a small cluster of um, towns outside. Um, I had the big pleasure to get to bike everywhere, which was wonderful. Um, through the course of my work, I um, focused on 14, I did intensive uh, case studies with 14 uh, patients and their families and their providers. Um, but over the course of the whole year, I met with about 192 uh, patients who you would consider um, somewhere in that last phase uh, of end of life. And overall, I met with about 650 patients over the course of that time. Um, so uh, I also went back and did additional research in 2008 and 2012, looking at some of their innovations in long term care. So when uh, before I left for the field, as you say, in anthropology, my expectation uh, coming from the US was that I would see a very, um, uh, I would see the, the end of life, that, I, that, that euthanasia is 
is talk how it's talked about in newspapers. So, you know, uh, a lot of the headlines are either extremely for or extremely against uh, euthanasia, which is what is largely practiced in, in the Netherlands, which is where a physician at your um, request will uh, come and give you some medication that will put you, first uh, all your muscles will um, be relaxed, you'll go to sleep, and then they'll um, give you something else that will stop your heart. So uh, in Holland, most of the time, it's euthanasia that gets done, not assisted dying, which is distinguished as um, a physician provider giving you a prescription that you take on your own terms, right? Um, so I was expecting when I went to the Netherlands to just witness a lot of end of life scenes and and get a lot of that sort of uh, pro and, and against um, perspectives that we tend to get when we read about euthanasia. What I actually found was something quite, quite different. And what I found was over the course of 15 months with uh, those 192 end of life patients, I found that uh, euthanasia is largely experienced not as a life ending act, but instead as a very lengthy conversation between a provider and uh, their the patients and the family. Um, and the more questions a provider has, about somebody's request for euthanasia, the longer the discussions get drawn out and the more uh, questions and space for processing um, somebody's request uh, occurs. So that was my number one uh, surprise is that this is actually usually not an end of life situation. It's usually a discussion. Um, and what I found is that in, in the Netherlands, it was, I could kind of divide it into five different stages. Um, and I had 14 people that I tracked intensively over the course of my year there. Um, so I had about 14 patients with uh, euthanasia requests. And so the first stage was, would be when the initial request might come in. And sometimes that would be years or months prior to that person uh, dying. So basically you might think you, you might get a health scare um, or you might just be planning ahead and you ha would have a conversation with your general practitioner and say, hey, you know, I think, you know, if I ever was in that situation, I might want euthanasia. And so that's what kicks off the discussion then between the patient, the patient's family, who's always included in all the discussions I was involved in um, and that provider. Um, but what would happen is uh, that's usually where a, a lot of the um, discussions would would end after starting the discussion and you know uh, figuring out that the provider would be willing to give you euthanasia if ever it was uh, something um, necessary. That's where a lot of people would just end end the discussion right there. The ones who didn't end it would move to the next step, and that was to get a written declaration. Um, so, uh, all the declarations I saw again were written out by the patient and signed by the family members because in Holland, um, consensus is something that's very, very important to them and having, um, and, and I believe they have a, an understanding that. Of course, at the end of life, no person makes that decision alone. They make it in the context of their social connection. So family was always very, very, um, uh central to all the discussions and included the written declaration. Um, that's where most people would drop off between those, those two um, stages. If you did keep going, then you might uh, go to the next stage where you got a second opinion. Typically, that was when somebody was um, uh, very, very ill and, um, and a second opinion would be likely, if you were heading to a second opinion, the likelihood of you actually going through of it came came up quite a bit, as you can see in my small uh, sample. Then the next step was setting a date, and then um, uh, uh, and then your actual death. And you can see of the fourteen people uh, that I tracked over the course of a year, um, you know, um, only three of them died by euthanasia, and one one of the conversations started about seventeen days prior. Um, 
to their death. The other was 90 days and, and the third was 180 days. So, so what this changed for me is that it changed my focus of my research. This is not just about a, a death event. This is about a long discussion. And so it begged the question for me, what are people talking about when they talk about euthanasia? Oh, man, I thought I had turned that off. Um, so let me move on. Uh, move it up. So um, when I look at the numbers for um, for the country in Holland, what I find is something similar. So I found that uh, of every person who would uh, initiate a euthanasia request with their physician, only one in 10 would actually go through with it. And if you look at these numbers here, um, look at these initiated requests here at the bottom. So this is the ratio of uh, initiated requests to actual deaths. Um, and these are, the, these are the people who actually went through with it. So you see in 2015, it was one in 10, it was 10, 10%. Um, the year of my study, it was 11.3. Uh, so basically what I find is that you have a lot of people who are requesting for euthanasia, um, but not that many people going through it. That, and so this led me to my second main finding, um, which is that there's something about talking about euthanasia that actually served a palliative um, function. There was something about those discussions that actually kept people living longer and wanting to live longer than um, people who didn't have the opportunity to have this discussion. And so um, I came to uh, find in my research that there's this thing that we call social death, death of the so social being. And it's, it's basically a time where um, someone will, uh, it, it's a perception and it's not always shared equally by the way, and it kind of comes and goes. But I, I know, uh, you know, from my, my uh, experiences with people who were dying, there's something about that social being that will disappear for some time and maybe come back or, or disappear and not, not come back. Um, so I would have people tell me when I was in Holland, they'd pick up a photo of their wife and say, hey, this is actually my wife, the woman in the bed, that's not my wife anymore. Um, and what they were trying to say, they weren't trying to just be rude because it was kind of a shocking statement for me to hear. Um, but what they were trying to say is, is something about this concept of social death. There's sociality dies a little bit near the end when you're not able to keep participating in the main things that we share as social beings. So that's um, conversation, that's sharing food, that's list, being able to listen to somebody. So all of these things are important things for social life. So I wanna go and switch gears and I wanna highlight a story that is actually from, um, that's personal to me. This is my mother. And I wanna talk, tell you a little about my mother and my father and what they went through in the US. And through their story, I wanna highlight the big differences between US and uh, hot Dutch end of life. So this is my mom, her name is Frances. I'm also named Frances, obviously. And uh, her mother's name was Frances and her mother's father's name was Frances. So we're on a long line of Frances's. Um, she was four foot 11 and she was the matriarch of our family. She was really just a beautiful light, um, a long time Buddhist practitioner an artist, this is um, um, on the left is a um, beautiful uh, drawing that I just pulled out uh, to show you uh, how wonderful she was at um, capturing the essence of uh, beauty in others. Uh, but my mother was just a wonderful person and um, ironically for me at the uh, very end of my research in the Netherlands, I got my call um, and I, you know, you uh, some of you on the phone uh, might know what you mean by, know what I mean by that. But I got the call that um, she was, uh, she'd been diagnosed with cancer and it had metastasized and there was nothing more that they were gonna be able to do for her. So I uh, immediately booked a ticket, left everything in Holland. Uh, I came home, I was the sibling without the uh, real job. 
Um, anyway, so I, I came home to take care of my mother. I didn't know how long it would be. So I was there during the week and on the weekends, I would, uh, I take a little restaurant job just to get me out of the house. Um, and then on the weekends, my siblings, we had, uh, 4 of us. So my, my other 3 siblings would take turns coming to visit. Um, my father would go to work during the day. Uh, during the day I would sit with my mom. She was still able, she was mobile. And she was able to care for herself and do a lot of the things that um, she liked to be able to do. Um, but she really, she did not feel well. And the nights were rough. And uh, she was on morphine and a lot of anti nausea. And so sometimes I would sleep at the foot of her bed. Sometimes I'd just stay up all night with her. And then sometimes she'd kick me out and, you know, take her privacy. Um, but we had five wonderful weeks uh, together. And, um, you know, I'm so grateful for every minute of it um, during the day when she was feeling good enough to get up, she would go through her things and kind of set her affairs in order. We wrote her will, and then we went through her beautiful art. She had these big, huge paintings and art artwork everywhere. And we, sh she made decisions about who she wanted to have each piece of artwork. So sorry about that. Uh, so. Anyway, so she did die um, about five weeks after I came home. And I just want to make this one point about my mother is that um, the reason that she never went to a doctor and didn't find the cancer in time is because she, like many, many, too many Americans, didn't have health coverage. My father had a pre existing condition, he'd had a, um, a mild heart attack when he was young. And so he really struggled to keep us in health care, the four kids, the family in health care going through. He worked pretty much throughout his life. He was a nuclear physicist, so he worked for NASA for a while. He was an academic for a little bit, did some other things. And um, so the reason that she died early, because she did die at 63, in my opinion, was because they didn't have they didn't have health coverage. And so I think the ACA took us uh, a really good step forward to make it so that people don't have to die like my mother did. Um, but I do uh, blame lack of health coverage um, for her not finding the cancer until it was way too late. So I want to move on and tell you a little bit about what happened to my father. Again, a case that is not unusual in the US. Um, so my dad, after my mom uh, passed away, he started dating, which was horrible for the sibling, my siblings and myself, you know, so we weren't ready for that. So he started dating. Um, and uh, so we, we, uh, we sat through that for about a year. And then after about a year after she passed, he had a massive stroke and it was so big um, uh, that he was, you know, he went and he did the 60 days re rehab, or I think 90 days rehab that Medicare pays for. And then, I don't know if you, everyone knows this, but we don't have long term care in this country, right? Um, so after the 90 days rehab, uh, we had to find a place for him to live. We found assisted living, which I thought was um, the most similar to the um, regular nursing homes that are available to everyone on a sliding scale fee, fee and free of charge for those who can't afford it. So. Things that uh, assisted living here is very similar to nurse regular nursing homes in the Netherlands, right? Um, life affirming for the most part, um, let, letting people bring in their own furniture, let you make your own choices, let you, um, you know, be the, the the owner of your day and the driver of your own relationships. Um, unlike, in my opinion, a lot of the nursing homes here that tend to do unto people and do for them and don't let them do things in equal, you know, give and take in equal measure. Um, so my, my father was in assisted living for a while and that was positive. He really, really liked getting the uh, rehab. And so Medicare paid that for that a little bit longer, uh, but then he, he got cut off of all the um, speech therapy because uh, Medicare wouldn't pay for it anymore. And that was the one thing that was making him feel like he was making progress. And it was the one person that he was feeling emotionally connected to that was uh, uh, in the provider staff, but they wouldn't pay for that anymore. 
even though I felt like it was providing so much more than just speech therapy. Um, so I think that was um, not positive. So he languished in um, in a assisted living for a long time. Um, we did the spend down. We sold his house. We sold everything that they had ever um, built their entire lives. We liquidated all of it to keep him in a semi nice place for as long as we could keep him there. And when the money ran out, we had him switched over to Medicaid. It took about, I think about nine months um, wrangling with a lawyer to try to make that happen. And then the only options that we had at that point was uh, nursing homes and they were all on the watch list for endangering the safety of the people living there. But that was the only place that we could find that was near one of the family members and would take Medicaid. So that's that's that was what we were left with. And so he languished there a little bit longer and uh, eventually died, you know, alone, lost everything, and he died scared and alone. And so that was, that's that's that was my father's death and i think that is a travesty and should not happen to anyone and i hope that what we can do is make it better so um i don't want to take much longer but i want to highlight some lessons that i think we can take away uh from what i learned in holland and saw that you know was uh was available there versus what is available here um, and I would say my first thing that I learned is that discussion is key at the end of life. We have to have a space for people to talk about what they care about, what matters to them. And this needs to be among their family, whoever, however they define family, friends, their, their close loved ones. It needs to, there also needs to be a space between patients, families, and providers to have these kinds of conversations. Conversations are key because if we don't know what somebody, what people care about, you know, we might be trying, I, I feel like what we tend to do at the end of life is we do more about their medical, but we're doing virtually nothing about their social. And end of life, we have social needs. We largely have social needs because most of the medical needs is only palliative at that point. You can't fix it. You can only maintain and and you know try to mitigate um, the physical. So let's shift the focus from the medical to the social at end of life. It actually costs a lot less and it does so much more. So discussion and social connection to me is key. Another lesson that I think is very important is this what I learned with my father in uh, institutional care. Too many long term care facilities will do to you. They'll, they'll come in and they'll give you a bath. They do it on their schedule. They don't ask you your, your choice. What do you do? You want a bath? Do you want a shower? Do you want this? Do you want that? That doesn't, that largely is not happening in a lot of these nursing homes. I want to see where we foster. The, get, the regular give and take that all the, that makes us human. That's what's important. So my father became institutionalized, wouldn't even leave the room and then wouldn't even leave the bed, not because he physically couldn't, because he was socially scared to leave the confines of an ever shrinking world for him. And if they had let him keep some kind of, I don't care what they call this, some kind of therapy where he's connecting with a, another human being and he would make her laugh and that made him feel good, right? He would tell us stories, she would listen or vice versa. Giving and taking is what makes us social. And so our, our long-term care facilities need to foster that regular give and take, um, let people cut up food for dinner, let people um, help others. That's, that's what long-term care should be about. Um, right now, we do not have much in the way of long term care. I feel like we need to um, keep talking to our Congress people and we need to um, for our families and ourselves. We need to explore options early. I don't know if it's going to be like a, um, you know, a small house in the backyard. That's that's, uh, you know, wheelchair friendly for mom or dad. I don't know, but these are uh, things that need to be improved and until Congress fixes it. We're going to have to uh, be uh, creative and, and explore options.
Finally, I want to mention that um, I know this is a, a group that's uh, very big on assistance and dying. Uh, I'm actually, I am in support of it, but only when a physician assisted dying is a choice among other positive choices. If you are near the end of life and you have run out of money, you know, you may start with money, but if you live a long time, you, you're probably going to run out like my father did. And it is not, it is not a choice if the choice is between that nursing home that we had had an option to or physician assisted to uh, dying. So my suggestion is let's I, I, I I'm all for physician assisted dying. I think it should be. And there's places where it is absolutely appropriate and everyone should have their choice to make those choices. Um, but I also would like to see it a choice among many positive choices. And then finally, uh, I just want to end with um, a quote from my mother. I think what I learned most about my time in the Netherlands is that um, uh, studying end of life and euthanasia is actually not about studying death. It's about studying how we live best with the time that we have. How do we make the most of the time and the connections that we've got? So I wanna close off with a quote from my mother and then, um, and then turn it over tomorrow. So uh, my mother was very sweet. She wanted to be in my study. So we did interviews near the end. And so this is uh, one thing that she told me about how it felt to be um, near the end of her life. She said, now I'm seeing things as having an ending. Every morning I wake up, it's another morning that I didn't know if I'd have or not. It's a beautiful morning and the beauty is more alive and real than the beauty I was seeing before because it's not overlaid with concepts of what I ought to do or what it ought to be or what I want it to be or what other people might want it to be. It doesn't have any of that, it just is. So you start seeing it without these little parameters. And when you hear people talk, it's so strange because they seem to be talking about a lot of things that don't matter. In the other world I used to live in, I would go along with it, but now I don't have to put up with that. I don't want to waste my time with stuff that is junk, that isn't going to get resolved, that isn't going to make people happy. Just let the world happen. Watch it a little bit, and it will tell you what it wants and what it needs from you. It doesn't need a whole lot, maybe just a little acceptance, maybe, or appreciation and participation. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Francis, um, for your wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, to our audience listening in, uh, feel free to input any questions you have for um, Professor Norwood in the chat. Um, and now I'd like to turn to Dr. Mara Bookbinder for her presentation. So, um, uh, Mara, you have the uh, presenting privileges. Please uh, go ahead. Wonderful, um, and I'm just going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, so thank you so much to Sarah for the invitation. Um, it's really an honor to be here today, especially to be here with uh, Francis, whose work was so influential on me as I started to to work on this topic myself. And and I really am so grateful to you for sharing those really moving stories. Um, and, and your mother's words were so moving. Um, so, uh, and, and also, I guess I wanted to say it's so nice to, to be sharing this platform with another anthropologist, which is so rare for me when I present on this work. So it's great to have two of us here. So I'm going to be um, talking to you today about work that I conducted um, between 2015 and 2017, looking at the implementation of Vermont's medical aid, aid and dying law. Um, and I want to start just by acknowledging my funding support from the Greenwall Foundation and the National Science Foundation and my department here at UNC, as well as support from my wonderful research assistants. And I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. And I'm going to start by telling you about two case vignettes because anthropologists really love to, uh, to talk about stories. So the first is about a woman that I'll call Frances, and all of the names that I'm going to use in my talk today are pseudonyms. And I had the pleasure of meeting Frances in her home a few years ago. 
And she was in her 60s and she had been living with ALS for several years. And I walked into her home and it was this beautiful rustic log cabin that she had planned to retire to with her husband. And she was sitting on the couch waiting for me and she handed me a piece of paper with a note on it. And she had written out what she wanted to tell me because at this point the ALS had already severely impacted her speech and she was communicating primarily via iPad. And that's how we sort of did the interview. I would ask a question and she would type out a response on the iPad. Um, but this is what her notes said, and I'll read it to you. I've been a critical care RN 1975 to 2015, seen many patients die on respirators, tied down, pleading eyes as I give meds to settle them. But who knows what they were thinking trapped like that? Families coming and going exhausted. In acute care, some patients would never go through what was going to happen to them if they had the choice. But once that starts in that setting, there's no going back. They die attached to tubes, feedings, incontinent, no communication, tears sliding from corners of eyes. Many patients and families need to have this option. It's our bodies and lives and should always be our choice. When and how we die is our right. I would advocate for my patients with no hope at all, but would be endless discussion with their team of doctors, then each specialist weighing in, then palliative care, then family meetings, on and on. But the one person left out is the one dying slowly who was never given a choice. And Frances went on to hasten her death using medical aid and dying just a few weeks after we met. So I now want to share with you an email that I received from a prospective study participant in April of 2017. And I'll call her Margot. And she had heard about my study from a hospice volunteer that had helped take care of her husband as he was dying. And her email read, my husband died one year ago. He suffered from a chronic disease for which there was no cure. He very much wished to have a dignified pain-free death on his terms and was hopeful that Act 39 would make that possible. And Act 39 is the name of Vermont's medical aid and dying statute. We were shocked to learn that our local hospital prohibits its physicians from participating in Act 39. An exhaustive search elsewhere in Vermont was no less promising as we were informed by several physicians that heightened scrutiny in Vermont made them reluctant to participate. At a time when I should have been comforting my dying husband, I was desperately trying to navigate Act 39 on his behalf. I regret that it took me from his bedside. I think Vermonters would be shocked if they knew how inaccessible Act 39 is. And when I interviewed Margo in her home just a couple of months later, she told me, I feel really badly that Vermonters are under the, under the illusion that Act 39 is available to them. And it really wasn't, was my experience. So what I wanna suggest is that these two stories represent what I like to think of as two distinct faces of medical aid in dying. And Francis's story is the one that tends to be emphasized in advocacy discourse. So we have a terminally ill patient who wants to control the time and circumstance of her death and she requests assistance from a trusted physician who will then accede to the patient's wishes. And some of you might recognize this uh, photograph. This is Brittany Menard. Um, in 2014, at the age of 29 years old, she became the face of the assisted dying movement when she moved to Oregon to take advantage of the state's death with dignity law after being diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. But one of the goals from the beginning of my research has been to bring to the foreground the gaps between these advocacy narratives and what aid in dying actually looks like when it's put into practice. And so this is a picture of Judy Dale and her family sued the UCSF Medical Center in 2016 in California for allegedly misleading Dale into thinking that they would be willing to prescribe lethal medication under the state's medical aid in dying statute. And so in my view, both of these kinds of stories, as well as the stories of Francis and Margot, are really central to understanding what medical aid in dying is like in the US today. So the legalization of medical aid in dying in the US has proceeded at the state level, beginning with the passage of Oregon's Death with Dignity Act in 1997. And that same year, two Supreme Court decisions rejected the notion that there's a constitutional right to die with the assistance of, of a physician, but really left the door open for individual states to authorize the practice. And that's what we've seen over the past couple of decades. The number of permissive jurisdictions is now 11, making this option available to a little more than one in five Americans. Um, 
Now in Montana, the Montana has sort of a, a lighter shade of teal here because there, there is not a regulatory statute in place in Montana. Um, aid in dying was legalized via a court ruling, but there's uh, no uh, legal apparatus in place regulating it. And it's worth noting that this is really a rapidly shifting landscape. The New Mexico bill was uh, signed into law most recently, just last spring. And then there've also been um, several states with existing legislation on the books that have um, introduce new laws to modify some of the laws and eliminate some of the safeguards and try to make access a little bit easier. And that's one of the things that I'm going to talk about today. In terms of why people are pursuing medical aid in dying, I think that data from the last 20 plus years of research in Oregon suggests that most people who pursue this option are not motivated by concerns about pain, but it's really about um, a loss of autonomy and a loss of dignity at the end of life. And so what we see is that patients who seek medical aid and dying are really expressing a desire to control the time and circumstances of death once we know that death is inevitable. So the law that I studied was Vermont's law. It's called the Patient Choice and Control at End of Life Act. It was passed in 2013. I have a picture here on the slide of former Governor Peter Shumlin signing this bill into law. Um, and the reason I went to Vermont is because at the time that I began this study, I was really interested in knowing what happens when these laws are new. And this was the state that had most recently legalized, which is the reason I decided to focus on it. And, you know, when I started to call people in Vermont and, and try to identify stakeholders that might help me with this work, they all told me to go to Oregon. And, and said, you know, they've been doing it way longer than we have. And I, I had to explain that I was really interested in, in what it was like when it was new and it was being interpreted on the ground and put into practice. Vermont, it was also interesting because it was the first state to utilize the, the state legislature as opposed to the courts or a ballot initiative to, to legalize. And, and Vermont does not have a ballot initiative process. Um, Vermonters are really proud of this because there was a lot of grassroots mobilization that went into place to make this possible. And I think it paved the way for other states like California to follow after. Now, the, the medical and legal requirements are largely identical to those in place elsewhere in the US. The law permits physicians to write a lethal prescription to a mentally competent adult patient. Um, Frances touched on this in, in her talk, but in the US, we don't allow any sort of um, euthanasia or physician administered medication to end someone's life. There are a lot of requirements in place. There has to be a terminal diagnosis, which is defined as uh, a diagnosis in which death is expected within six months. There have to be two voluntary oral requests spaced 15 days apart at least. There has to be a voluntary written request signed in the presence of two witnesses who are not related to the patient. The diagnosis and prognosis have to be certified by a second physician. The medication must be self-administered. And most of these are designed to ensure that the practice is voluntary for patients. And of course, it's also voluntary for physicians as well. In January of 2018, the Vermont Department of Health released its first report about the utilization of medical aid and dying in the first four years of, um, of the law's existence, which, um, aligned with the period of my research. And it, it's worth noting that there were no prescriptions written at all in the first 18 months. And, and so the numbers are a little bit skewed in that sense, but you can see that the frequencies are pretty low because Vermont is a very small state. It has a population just over 600,000. So uh, in this time period, paperwork for 52 patients was filed. And most of these were for cancer diagnoses. 60% of these patients had died as a result of ingesting the medication, which is actually a little bit higher than we've seen with the data in Oregon. Um, and then these numbers didn't rise very much in the subsequent two year reporting period. So I think what these statistics illustrate is that it really is going to be a small segment of American society that's likely to experience medical aid in dying themselves. But at the same time, I think the cultural impact stretches much further than these numbers might otherwise suggest because um, very similar again to what Francis was talking about, medical aid in dying is discussed far more often than it's performed. And I think it can serve as a gateway for other kinds of conversations about end of life concerns. 
And I think there's a way in which it changes the broader public conversation about control over the dying process. So in terms of my research, my primary methods included 144 semi-structured in-depth qualitative interviews. All but three of these were conducted in person and almost all of them were audio recorded. I gave participants a choice about that. I also observed in medical conferences for Vermont healthcare providers in uh, public events organized by advocacy groups. And I have a few photos of some of these on the slide here. And then there was also a, a judicial challenge to the law that took place during the period of my research, and I attended some of the hearings for that as well. This is a, a map of the representation of my research subjects. And, um, you know, one of the benefits of doing this work in a state like Vermont is that I was able to talk to most of the key players and really interview a majority of the prescribers in the state, at least at the time that I did the study, and many of the key policy stakeholders. And I want to show the geographic distribution in part to highlight that I, I talked to people all over the state. And although a lot of these interviews were clustered kind of in the metropolitan regions of Burlington and Montpelier, I interviewed a lot of people in rural areas as well. And that was really important because access looked very different in different parts of the state. And that was a big part of the story that my research told. And that is actually what I want to talk to you about next. So, um, so the advocacy and media discourses suggest really that legalizing medical aid in dying ensures choice at the end of life. But the reality is that many patients encounter substantial obstacles to accessing medical aid and dying once it's legalized. And I wanted to share with you a little bit about why this is the case and what some of these barriers are. So this is sort of, this is an overview of the barriers that I identified in my research. And they include, first of all, the legislative safeguards, which required that medication be ingested and self-administered. And remember, that's to ensure that it's voluntary and that patients aren't coerced against their will into taking life-ending medication. But the consequence of that is that people with certain medical conditions who had mobility issues or swallowing difficulties, particularly later on in their illness, were excluded. And, and many people spoke about how the law seemed to be designed for, for people with cancer and not quite as accessible for people with for example, neurological conditions. The cost of the medication could also be a barrier. Um, at the time of this study, uh, the, the cost of a lethal dose of sequinol was about $3,000, and that was the first drug of choice at the time. And there were alternatives, and there are alternatives today, but not physicians were not always aware of these alternatives. Then finding a physician willing to prescribe could be very difficult. And it often depended on your social network and how connected you were to, to other healthcare providers. I think in general, it was easier for patients who were treated at the UVM Medical Center, which is the only academic medical center in the state of Vermont. Um, but really, access did not cut neatly across urban rural lines. And there were some rural counties where access was quite good simply because there were one or two physicians who were really willing to provide this service. Access to information about medical aid and dying, including simply knowing that it's an option that's legal in your state, could also be an issue because physicians didn't always inform patients that they had this option. Um, and I think it's also worth noting that differential access to information also applied to physicians. So the knowledge of the law and knowledge of different medication protocols varied among physicians as well. And then finally, social support to navigate this process and um, assist with finding a physician, completing the paperwork, and planning for the death itself, which was a very social event for many people. So I'm not going to have time to, to talk about all of these in great depth, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end if you'd like to hear more about any of these. But I do want to speak a little bit more about finding a physician. And so this is what Margot, the second woman whose story I started with, what she had to say about the process of trying to identify a physician for her husband. She said, I contacted Compassion and Choices, which is this national organization that helps you access death with, dig with dignity. So they said I would just have to find, you know, two doctors in Vermont to prescribe. So I said, okay, great. Could you tell me what doctors have been prescribing? No, we can't tell you that. 
So I said, well, how am I supposed to find two doctors? I just can't go knocking on their doors. I'd have to transfer all the, they're not gonna meet with me without all our records being transferred. And I can't do that 30, 40, 50 times. And then I interviewed a nurse uh, practitioner who worked in an oncology practice in a part of the state where access was very severely constrained. And she was just quite distressed about having to navigate this access issue with her patients and, and be the one to tell them that it wasn't gonna be possible. And of course, nurse practitioners uh, cannot prescribe in, in Vermont, it has to be a, a physician. So she told me, it's very nice to have this, but I think you don't have equity. You can use it if you're a patient who meets all the criteria, then is lucky enough to have a primary care physician who knows you and then is willing to participate. So based on these findings, I've argued that access to medical aid and dying is stratified based on socioeconomic privilege. And what I mean by this stratification, I think is really nicely summed up by this quote where a physician said to me, the situation is very elitist. Someone has to have the intellectual wherewithal to track down a physician who's willing to prescribe and follow through with that. They have to be able to track down a pharmacy that's willing to dispense medication, and they have to be able to afford it. And most people who are in the last month of life who meet the criteria to go through with this don't have the resources intellectually, cognitively, emotionally, financially. So it limits it to a very, very small group of people. It seems not fair that way too. And these access barriers are not unique to Vermont. This is just a, a sample of some recent headlines from Colorado and Hawaii and Washington DC addressing patients' obstacles in gaining access to medical aid and dying. So I've told you a little bit about the barriers that people sometimes encounter in pursuing an assisted death. And I now wanna shift gears to tell you a bit about what these deaths actually looked like for people that were able to gain access. And one of the richest and most interesting parts of this study for me has been hearing about how people plan for death when given the opportunity to do so. And I would say even choreograph their deaths when given the opportunity to do so. This here is a photograph of Betsy Davis. It was not taken uh, from my research, but um, Betsy Davis was a 42 year old woman diagnosed with ALS who chose to die using California's End of Life Options Act in 2016. And she invited friends and loved ones to a two day rebirth ceremony. That was the, the terminology that she used. And she died on the side of a hill as the sun was setting, which was her choice. And I think when I look at this scene, it, it really looks to me like a wedding. Um, so we think kind of joyous celebration, perhaps more than, um, more than a somber gathering. And this was, um, this was an extreme example. It, it's not that uh, all of the patient stories I collected in my research looked quite like this, but I think there are several elements in Betsy's death story that were commonly present in the deaths that were recounted to me in my research. And so they include the presence of close family and friends. This was almost always a very, very social experience. There was a sacred atmosphere, but this could range from something kind of more joyous and party-like as we see here to something more um, somber and sad. There was almost always a ritual element like a final toast. Um, and all of these deaths in Vermont occurred in domestic or non-medical settings. And part, part of the reason for that, at least in Vermont, is there is um, there's a piece of the law that permits institutions, uh, hospitals, skilled nursing facilities to prohibit patients from ingesting life ending medication on their premises. And almost all of them have done this. I think there's one continuing care retirement community that, that has said it's okay for patients to ingest medication on their premises, but most of them have prohibited it. So as a result, um, it, these deaths are, are largely taking place at home. So I'm gonna share a few of these with you. Renee Long was a woman in her 60s who had a terminal cancer diagnosis. She was single and she didn't have any children, but her spiritual community was a really important source of support through her diagnosis and eventual death. And I'm gonna read a, a, an excerpt from an essay that I wrote about her. While Renee said her goodbyes, four friends sat in a circle and prepared the medication with a makeshift ritual ceremony. Using beautiful pottery and sacred chalices, they emptied a hundred capsules the number of secanol pills required to form a lethal dose, 
singing while they worked, and carefully mixed the powder with juice. They all piled on the couch for a final photo shoot. Renee laid across their laps in a favorite leopard print and purple velvet outfit. Then, in her signature no-nonsense style, Renee got into bed and started directing everyone on where to stand. They surrounded her as she drank, chanting softly. Ten minutes later, she was dead. Okay, um, the next one is Bennett Tucker, and he was a man in his late 70s who had endured a slow decline after a long-term cancer diagnosis. And in his last two years, his symptoms worsened and his quality of life deteriorated. For years, his wife, Noreen, had dutifully helped him navigate clinical trials and chemotherapy, but bathing, dressing, catheterizing, and moving him had become physically taxing, and she was discouraged that he wasn't getting better. And it was at the point where Noreen felt she would soon need to get full-time nursing support in the home when Bennett announced that he was ready to take the life-ending medication that they already had on hand. This was something that they had been discussing for a long time, and he had indicated months before that it was an option he would like to pursue. To prepare for his death, Bennett was discharged from a local inpatient hospice facility where he had been admitted for a short-term pain management stay. And on his second day home, a physical therapist came to work on Bennett's pain, which was a side effect of his bone metastases. And she helped him walk outside to sit on the deck in the sun, fulfilling one of his last wishes. When he came inside, Bennett climbed into bed and said to, to Noreen and his three children, what are you waiting for? Let's do it. They had expected him to wait another few days and they were surprised by this sudden decision. After calling Bennett's best friend to say goodbye, Noreen and their children surrounded his bed. They told Bennett they loved him and his son, a physician, left the room to prepare the medication, adding Gatorade for flavor. Bennett drank the mixture quickly as he had been advised by his physician. And as he swallowed the last few drops, his family told him that they would miss him. Bennett closed his eyes and Noreen described, it was as if he was falling asleep, no gaping mouth, no twitching, no nothing, just really relaxed. In a matter of minutes, Bennett was gone. Okay, so I also wanted to share a slightly less positive outcome, um, which were rare, but did happen. And for that, I'm gonna actually refer back to Frances, who's the woman I started with, who's the woman whose note I started with. And she had ALS and the ALS cases, uh, at least that, that I heard about, seemed to go a little bit less smoothly in part because of the issues with mobility and swallowing later on in the illness. And Frances had been told by her physician that she had to be able to swallow, she was gonna mix the medication, she mi did mix the medication with applesauce. And she had been told she had to be able to consume uh, the, that quantity of applesauce in under two minutes. And when I met her, she actually showed me these little snack cups of applesauce that she was practicing with and her husband was timing her. And, and she was doing well. Um, it, she had been consuming it within a minute and 15 seconds. But in the last few days leading up to the date she had set for her death, it was taking her more like two and a half minutes. So they had a sense that the timing might be a problem and they had a contingency plan in place that she had worked out with her physician. So the, the excerpt that I'm gonna read for you is from Francis's physician actually recounting to me what happened. She said, I got a call around 5 a.m. from the hospice nurse saying she had fallen asleep and she couldn't swallow it. She got about half of it in and fell asleep and so she didn't die from that directly. So she took it at around three. At five, the hospice nurse called me the hospice nurse was going out there. I said, start the morphine and hopefully it has replaced her enough that she'll have respiratory depression. But the hospice nurse was crying. She goes, this isn't how it's supposed to happen. And it was interesting because I didn't feel at all panicked. I was like, you know, that was her path that she tried. It didn't work, but we know what she wants. She wants to be very comfortable. So we'll just start her on the morphine. If we have to go any higher than 20 milligrams an hour, I'm coming out. As I was going from my house to the hospital, she called and said, Francis died. So I wanna say that I think this is fairly typical of a bad outcome case. Um, and I, I don't wanna minimize it because these prolonged deaths could be very distressing for the family. And sometimes it would take longer than the six hours that it took Francis to die um, from the time ingesting the medication. But I think that that sort of distress is um, is pretty much the worst case scenario. And I mean, it, I did, there was one uh, 
death in my sample um, described to me about a patient who tried to do a morphine overdose and ended up waking up and not dying, but he had been warned that 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 might be possible and that it might not be a, a lethal dose. Um, even in these cases where there was prolonged uh, a prolonged dying period, most caregivers were very, very happy with the outcome because it was meaningful to them that their loved one got to have the type of death that they wanted. So I think that these cases all highlight in various ways the fact that medical aid in dying is really an intensely social practice. And when I began this research, this was surprising to me, in part because the dominant advocacy discourse around medical aid in dying emphasizes this desire to be independent in the final stages of illness and to not want to be dependent on others. And the deaths that I started documenting revealed what I really saw as a critical disconnect between advocacy portrayals and lived experiences of medical aid and dying. Because what I saw, and I think this relates really nicely to something that Francis said, is that medical aid and dying was, was forging new forms of sociality and dependency through the death and dying process. And this is a major theme of my book, which was published last spring. Um, it's available on Amazon and um, all from all major booksellers. If you're interested in, in hearing more of the stories that I've shared today. Um, but what I found is that most caregivers really described an intensification of intimate ties around planning for death and around the scene of death itself. They talked about feeling in some instances, instances, feeling bonded to the people that were present for these deaths. Um, so I argue in the book that medical aid in dying really remakes sociality, even as it sets about ending life, which was somewhat of an unexpected finding for me, and that this really sticks with the caregivers who live on to tell its stories. But I think the caregiver's role in assistance um, in these assisted deaths is really largely uh, under acknowledged in the public discourse around medical aid in dying. Okay, so to conclude, I want to return to the question that frames this session, which is really what happens after legalization. And I think one answer to that is that access is not a guarantee and, and navigating access can be a frustrating experience for many patients and families. And I shared a bit of Margot's story with you here. There are other similar stories highlighted in my book. I do think for those who utilize it, medical aid in dying offers an enormous source of comfort and relief from unwanted suffering at the end of life. And this is certainly not something to take lightly. Um, but I also think that the emergence of such deaths also has a darker side, which is that medical aid in dying entails considerable pressure for the dying person and their caregivers to get things right. And there's always a possibility that the desire for medical aid in dying will go unfulfilled, as we saw with Margot's husband. And even in Frances Sullivan's case, death didn't proceed as swiftly as anticipated because she didn't get all of the applesauce down before losing consciousness. So I think my findings um, offer a cautionary tale regarding advocacy narratives suggesting that medical aid in dying legislation offers a clear cut pathway to self determination at the end of life. I think that my findings also highlight a second dimension that's often left out of the public conversation on medical aid and dying, which is that assisted dying is a deeply relational practice with important roles for caregivers and loved ones in witnessing and shepherding death. And, and of course, also for the physicians that, um, that help make this sort of a journey possible for a patient. So I think I will stop there, but I am really looking forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bofinder. It was incredible. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, I'll start with a few questions from our audience and then feel free to, to bounce ideas off of one another as we go. Um, uh, one per, one per, participant is wondering um, his experience with physicians as um, hospice clients, they tend to push for special dispensation or exclusions from the relevant state laws. Um, he's wondering if he's alone in these experiences. Um, any thoughts on his question? Um, 
I, I guess maybe I, I need more context for what sorts of dispensations they, he, he might be referring to, but um, I guess I didn't hear, I did interview hospice nurses and hospice physicians. That's not a side of the story that I heard a lot about. It may be because medically and dying was still pretty new at the time that I was doing this work. And so a lot of what I heard about from the hospice side was sort of about navigating hospice policies um, because initially the hospice agencies were very reluctant to let their nurses be present for these deaths, uh, to, to get involved with them at all. So um, it almost seems like that issue of, of um, uh, bending the, the inclusion criteria and expanding access would have been kind of a next level concern that, that a lot of the population in Vermont that I was dealing with might not have, have gotten to. Um, but, but certainly, I, you know, that, that may be happening now and that may be happening in other states. It sounds like it is. Yeah, yeah. and I just want to say uh, the, the stark contrast between what's available in the Netherlands versus what's available to support end of life in the U.S. is shocking. And uh, while hospice is just amazing when it does come in um, and with the little bit it can provide, uh, you know, compare, you know, somebody who can come in you know, you can get a nurse with hospice uh, coming in maybe twice, twice a week, and then you get a little bit of respite, uh, I think maybe, what is it, five hours a week, where, you know, a, a family member can go out and do something, um, and you get some medication and a few other things. Compare that with um, home care up to four times a day, overnight respite so that you can, uh, family members can sleep. Um, they'll come in and even if there's not someone there to open the door, they'll put a little lock box there, just like you would for a realtor. They'll let themselves in. They'll, uh, give the person breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They'll clean up a little bit. They'll, uh, give them medications, baths, you know, self-care, Treat, treat wounds, they'll bring in equipment, they'll uh, do modifications for the house. There's a whole house cleaning thing that comes in. So I think the Dutch have figured out, um, and I hope that we figure out that, um, that you've really got to bring the supports into the home and make them accessible for all, all no matter where you are in the socioeconomic uh, chain. Thank you both. Um, so our next question is from Dr. Lonnie Shavelson. He's um, the director of the uh, American Clinicians Academy on Medical Aid and Dying in California. Um, and um, he's wondering, Mara, uh, your work in, was in Vermont 2015 to 2017, and it was essential. How much about aid and dying care has changed since then? In what ways, and does your 2017 work in Vermont apply to aid and dying care in the wider United States today? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Dr. Shavelson. And I, I almost feel like you could answer that question better than I can. But um, I mean, I, I, I think that Vermont can be instructive in the sense that my the the data that I collected show us what happens in a period of great uncertainty when there's in the sort of in the period right after one of these laws is is implemented if we don't put a lot of thought into implementation and regulation the experience in california when california's law passed was incredibly different from what i saw in vermont um, in part because it's a much longer state, in part because of some subtleties in in the way that California's law was written, um, but there was a much more intentional emphasis on developing institutional policies around medical aid and dying. So there was, I think, much more of a bureaucratic infrastructure in place from the get-go which didn't exist in Vermont. I mean, part of the reason why it took a year and a half for any prescription to be written is as part of a, a kind of a legislative compromise, the law was written to be effective as soon as, as soon as it was signed. 
and there was no regulation in place, there was nothing from the Department of Health and no one felt comfortable prescribing. So I think it shows that you really need to listen to the medical community and get buy-in from physicians and hospitals if you wanna do something like this. Um, I think things have probably improved a, a bit in Vermont and yet we see some of these same patterns play out, particularly in some of the smaller states like Hawaii, for example, where we have similar struggles with access and, and regulation. So I, I do think that there are some important takeaways here for, for other places. Thank you. Um, a question from Arlene, uh, she's wondering, um, were you able to look at uh, medical aid in dying in the West Coast states? Um, she mentions that Washington has a robust volunteer group, which counsels people on how to talk with their physicians regarding aid in dying um, and a volunteer medical director who helps them find participating doctors if their own doctors will not or cannot participate. Um, and she also mentioned statewide volunteers who support people wanting to know all their options. Um, your thoughts? So uh, thank you for that question, Arlene, because it it raises an interesting point about Vermont. So there initially Compassion and Choices had a presence in Vermont similar to, um, to the presence that they have in Oregon. And I, I believe the advocacy group in, um, in Washington that has done some of this work is separate from Compassion and Choices. But there was a, a group of volunteers mobilized who wanted to provide bedside support for people pursuing medical aid and dying in Vermont very early on. And I interviewed some of the people that were hoping to do that work. And Compassion and Choices pulled away from that um, and, and did not want to have a bedside volunteer program similar to the one in Oregon. And I'm not completely familiar with all of the reasons for that and the politics behind that, but it did mean that Practically speaking, the process has been quite different um, in in Vermont than you know some of what people might be familiar with if you've seen the film How to Die in Oregon, for example, or if you're familiar with uh, with some of the work, the wonderful advocacy and support work that happens in Washington State. Um, I think there are some people in Vermont who might say that they didn't want that. Um, right, because a lot of what I heard in in my research was about well, Vermonters are very private, and and uh, they they wouldn't want a volunteer coming in to do this kind of work. I'm not sure I completely buy that. I mean, I I think that may be true on an indiv individual level, but I also think that there are folks who really would have liked that that kind of support, and there are um, some state specific ad, some kind of local advocacy groups in Vermont that have mobilized around the law. But as far as I know, and, and certainly at the time that I was doing this work, they weren't providing that bedside volunteer support that, that we see on the West Coast. You know, and Mara, you know what I'd love to see is, um, you know, and I don't think it necessarily has to be bedside, but I love that that offer. I just feel like we need, na we need navigators uh, for long-term care, end of life in general. And, um, uh, you know, if we had some folks who would uh, understood the system and could help us navigate it, I mean, to me, it's shocking that somebody who actually studies end of life, you know, would have those two experiences with my mother and my father. And it was a trajectory that I could not, no matter my background and savvy, I couldn't stop it. Um, but if, if, uh, if I'd had some navigators who could have helped me tap into, you know, even things that I might not know uh, and help me at least emotionally navigate that. Um, I, I think that would have been something I would have wanted. And, you know, just to have the offer of the bedside, I think is wonderful. The other point I wanted to make is um, you made the, the case about Francis's death being a, a little bit messy, you know, and that is the reason why in the Netherlands they do, they predominantly do euthanasia and not physician physician assisted dying, they call it PAS there. Um, but uh, the reason that they don't is they had so many um, cases where somebody would start to take it and, and then it wouldn't go. And then the doctor would, uh, and by the way, the doctors usually sits with you 
even when you're doing assisted dying. Um, but, you know, it takes longer and it can get messy where it doesn't, the person doesn't die, they slip into a coma. So then they'll come in and then give them um, a, a shot instead. But um, yeah, I think navigators, I think we all could benefit from all aspects of navigation at, at the end of life. Uh, just to pick up on that, I, uh, Bonnie has said in the chat that end of life doulas do that kind of work. And I agree, that's a, a really important point. Yeah. Uh, and I believe that some of the larger health systems in California actually have appointed made navigators to, in a narrow sense, to help uh, patients that are pursuing medical aid and dying. So that does exist in, in some locations. Oh, and then the other thing that I just wanted to respond to is about the, pre uh, Francis, you mentioned the presence of the physician at the death and um, uh, the ones that I, the stories that I told did not have physicians present. That was usually the choice of the patients. There were, I know of at least one patient who asked the doctor to be present very early on and the doctor was not willing to be present, but, um, but many were and uh, left it to the patient to decide whether or not they wanted a physician present. And, and I would say, I think it was less than half of the time that these patients opted to have a physician present. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Aubrey is wondering um, if you can talk more about the state of research as it related to moral distress for caregivers and what are ideal next steps for uh, knowledge um, in the next generation. Yeah, I might jump into the moral distress. Um, I, the physicians that I worked with and the home care nurses, um, what would stress them out is seeing suffering that they couldn't do anything about and seeing um, conflict that they couldn't resolve. They would actually, I had more than one physician actually call a family conference when um, they knew that like the daughter was not talking to the mom anymore or somebody was very, uh, I had a um, um, an elderly father who wasn't ready to see his daughter die. She, she was going to die and she had, chosen to um, consider euthanasia. And so physicians would actually call a family conference together and let everybody weigh in on, you know, the person would say why, why they're making this choice and why it matters to them and what they want. And then every family member would weigh in on it. Um, and I think that gave, um, I saw a lot in how the law was enacted in the Netherlands that gave physicians, um, something to do at the end of life where otherwise there's not much for them to do other than to maintain, you know, symptoms and, and alleviate uh, pain and suffering. Uh, it gave them something to do and it made them um, feel like their um, role was, it meant something. And almost every physician I talked to uh, described some aspect of, um, of how their relationship with both the patient and the family got stronger and closer and more intimate um, over the course of a euthanasia discussion. Um, so I think there's something very life affirming about walking with somebody through all the way to the end of life in whatever capacity that you do that. I think there's a great value in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Francis. The, the definition of moral distress is, um, when you know the the moral or the right thing to do, but you're prohibited from doing it because of institutional policies or other kinds of external constraints. And um, I think often for physicians, that's the way that might play out is around um, wanting to be able to help someone out of their suffering, but being legally prohibited from doing so because you live in a state where MAID is not an option. Um, in terms of the, the research landscape, I think thinking about moral distress, it, it's a great question and, and one that is uh, deserving of more study because I think a lot of the research that is, that, that is out there around physicians uh, or other healthcare workers and medical aid and dying is really focused a bit narrowly around questions of willingness to prescribe or how to respond to a patient's request. 
And those are important questions to be asking, but we know from my work and Francis's work that the act of writing a prescription is not the only way that a physician can get pulled into this kind of discourse and this kind of discussion. Um, but I don't think we have a lot of studies really looking kind of more broadly at moral experience for healthcare providers around this issue and around assisting patients in dying. And, and um, I think there's lots more that we could learn. Certainly from my own research, one thing that, that came up early on, and I, I think I alluded to this in some of the, in my response to one of the earlier questions, but was around hospice nurses. And there was one in particular who had been told by her agency that she could not be present. And she defied her agency and, and said, I'm not gonna do that to my patient. I'm going to be there anyway. And so I think that's a classic instance yeah, of moral yeah. distress. And it ended up working out okay and they ended up changing their policy in the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I saw a lot of Dutch doctors who felt um, honored to be there for the, uh, and, and some would describe it as I, you know, I brought her into this life and I'm, I'm helping, you know, helping her leave this life. And, uh, because the general practitioners tend to treat the whole family. And so there's kids and moms and dads and grandmas. So, um, they were very honored usually to be a part of it. And what I also like that I think is also important for this is the option to say no. And so I had physicians who would not. Um, perform euthanasia. And then I also had some who were very, would only do it uh, most reluctantly under, you know, extreme circumstances, which is why essentially what would happen, and I think what maybe needs to happen in the US um, is that uh, people would essentially go physician shopping, euthanasia physician shopping, basically. And they would go talk to their, they'd start with their physician, say, Hey, you know, if, if I got sick, would you be willing, you know, to consider euthanasia for me? And then if somebody said no, like I would only do it in this way, or I'm not willing, then they they go ahead and move doctors now instead of waiting till later uh, to do that. So maybe there's got to be a better way to do that in the U.S. without having to transfer all your documents, like I think somebody had mentioned. Great point. Thank you. Um, so, uh, the next question comes from a name you're likely familiar with, uh, Margaret Peggy Batten. Um, she was wondering uh, whether and what modifications in state made laws uh, that you support. Ooh, what modifications? I don't know, Mara, do you know about what's been modified? Well, so, I mean, if, if it's a personal question about my own views, I think um, I should start by saying that I, I have personally been somewhat ambivalent about medical aid and dying. I mean, I think if you pin me down, I, I would say that I, I support it. Um, but I think with some of the same reservations that Francis mentioned, which is to say that it, it be sort of offered as one of a variety of choices offered, including excellent uh, palliative care, um, but I, I, don't, I don't necessarily consider myself um, an advocate and in part because I see sort of some of the, um, some of the pitfalls of putting our policy attention around medical aid and dying over other kinds of um, policy interventions that could make end of life care better for for all dying people, um, right? So that so th this is sort of just um, some background information to talk about where where I struggle with this myself. Um, but in terms of how it might be modified, um, I, you know, I think that it would be nice, for example, in a state like Vermont, where there is a, a severe primary care shortage, and I, we see that in other states as well, it would be useful to make it possible for nurse practitioners to write these prescriptions. Um, I think that it would be really helpful if there was more education and informational resources available to both to patients and to physicians so that they 
so that physicians wouldn't have to feel like they were reinventing the wheel every time they did this for the first time, which is really the way it was described to me by Vermont um, by Vermont physicians. I think some of the other modifications on the table are around uh, the the utility and the reasonableness of waiting periods. So um, 17 days is the minimum that that it can take in Vermont. And um, I think Hawaii initially had a, a waiting, if I'm not mistaken, I think had a longer waiting period and, and has pulled back from that. So, you know, there's questions about whether it really makes sense if someone knows that they wanna do this to, to make them wait such a long time when we don't have such prolonged um, waiting periods for other kinds of healthcare services. And I think those are all uh, really reasonable questions to ask. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, Peggy, I, I see you're asking what, what modifications should there be? You know, I think, um, I actually think the law's written pretty well, like a really well written law can, um, you know, um, be flexible where it needs to be flexible, uh, but also make sure you're not going over boundaries you don't want to be going over. Um, so my sense is uh, from Oregon is that the laws here have been written fairly well. What what I'm really hearing from Mara um, is that the support for the operationalization of these laws have not been well thought out. And I mean, the big thing I, I would think is, um, you know, we know that talking about it helps and it helps make you feel connected as a human being to another human being. So let's, let's find some ways, you know, in the time, you know, from the request to, to um, end of life, let's find some ways to incorporate more space for asking people what they want in the, in the life that they have and what they want for their requests for youth or for assistance in dying, you know, and talk about what they need and, and, you know, how they want to spend their time. So I just think more connecting, um, less, less focusing on the medical and, and, you know, less focusing on what, what you can't fix at this point and, and more focus and more time and attention on supporting and asking people how they want to be supported and what they want to do with their time, you know? So when I, when I worked a little bit around um, end of life in the U S we would, you know, we were trying to formulate good questions that would help shape a, um, you know, person centered plan. Right. And a good person centered person directed plan asked people, well, you know, what do you want in the time that you've got? And, you know, someone might just want to be able to, to, sit up in the car long enough it would take to get to the wedding, sit through the wedding and then get home. And that might be the one thing that they want, they want out of the next month, you know? So you got, and if you don't ask that, then you don't know. So I would love to see us spend a little more time on the social side of end of life supports, discussing, fostering connection and asking people what they want. Mm -hmm. So, Mark's question is, is related to this element of implementation. Um, he's wondering, um, can you comment on what you have seen in terms of NGOs taking on um, kind of expanded efforts to support patients in this social context um, through, you know, in their initiatives um, and implementation support? Um, what state government sponsored initiatives are there, if any, and have you seen um, anything else related to that level of implement? Amara, I'm going to throw that to you, but I just want to say I like the idea of you know some non nonprofits cropping up to support this community because you're coming from a perspective typically that isn't just medical focused because um, these are not medical problems. But I bet Mara could speak to this one a little bit. Yes, I would say yes and right because they're they're not only medical problems, but they the the ultimate solution is a medical solution, and I think that you can run into problems when you pass a law, um, and you have advocacy organizations in place to support it, and yet you haven't actually engaged the physicians and made sure that they're on board. And so I think that can be a problem too, that the, that the legislative process 
is not always keyed into the realities of healthcare and into kind of what the experience might be for physicians. And if, if physicians are not gonna write the prescriptions, then this isn't gonna happen, right? Um, so I think that's one thing to make uh, the, the medical folks part of the discussion. But, um, but yes, I think that everywhere where this has been done in the US, advocacy groups, non-governmental advocacy groups have played a huge role in the implementation process. Um, and I think that that has kind of strengths and in some cases weaknesses. So it, it's worked really well in Oregon and Washington. And um, it, it hasn't worked as well in Vermont. And when Compassion and Choice is officially pulled out of Vermont, it left a big gap there. So I, I, I don't quite know what the solution is, um, but I do think that there has to be acknowledgement that um, that this really isn't going to happen without the support of those organizations that are willing to get information out to patients, um, willing to mobilize volunteers to to help with disseminating education, educational materials to patients. Uh, host public events so that people understand what their options are in their jurisdiction. Um, all of those activities have been so instrumental in places where it's been successful. And, and I would imagine, um, Francis, that it's been different in that sense than what you've seen in the Netherlands. And that actually might be um, something for us to talk about a little bit. Are, are there similar organizations in the Dutch context that do that work? I'm, I'm guessing not quite as much. Yeah, they're they're definitely there, um, and they focus on different aspects. Um, you know, so um, I found, however, that um, with the Dutch, they are they've been doing it a lot longer, right? So, and I think you know Vermont has been doing it a very short time, and so I think you're going to see the patterns, and you know, you're in a startup phase, is what you are. And Oregon is, you know, a little more established. Holland's been doing it since I, I think it was 84. So, um, so they, I think they have moved past a lot of the one arguing about things and, and the very polarizing debates around it. And they're just supporting it and moving on. Um, so, uh, but I find that there is a lot of misinformation. You'll have people come uh, to, ask for euthanasia and they think they, they can get it the next day, which is not the case. Um, and they don't realize all the rules for it and, and exactly how it goes. Um, and then I think the other uh, interesting thing about how it's practices, practice, practiced in the Netherlands is that they have come up with, and it's pretty consistent across the whole country, um, it's, it's practiced in very Dutch cultural ways. And the way they've done it is in such a way that um, each physician will take somebody, and this is not written anywhere, right? So that's why it's kind of odd that so many physicians are doing it in the same way. But the physician will say, okay, well, let's talk about your request right now and tell me why you want it. Let's talk with the family. And then they pause it at the end of that stage and they go, okay, well, you know, if you want to move on, let me know. Um, otherwise, how, you know, let's talk about your fever today. Well, how can we make you feel better? And so they have these stages in the discussion where they pause it and the onus is then on the patient to pick it up again and go, hey, I'm ready to keep moving it forward, right? So what's nice, I think, about how it has informally evolved as a, uh, as a practice is that it has all these stages that are natural places where the physician will, will say, okay, You've gotten through this stage, so you're good. So tell me about what else is going on. And they leave it there. And so it means that it's not a big ball that starts rolling downhill that gets out of hand and all of a sudden you're going through euthanasia when you're maybe have some doubts still. You actually really, as a patient, have to keep um, saying, yeah, let's move on to the next stage. Let's, let's do this again and to keep it going. Um, and so I do find that the people who do get euthanasia in the Netherlands tend to be people who are really ready for it. They've had a time to consider what that means for them. Their family have had time to consider 
what that means for them and their loved one. And the physician has been fairly central in a lot of the discussions. So um, I do think uh, we should think a little bit more about those informal processes that are, are um, particular to the US culture and how are those impacting the implementation of this law in these different places. That's where we need to spend a little time. And then, then once we understand how that's working, then we can optimize that in, in better ways that are make it more supportive for people who are wanting to go through that process. So Linda is wondering um, whether uh, you, Francis, can comment um, in more detail on the, your comment about social death. Um, especially in this time of COVID and great isolation. Um, yeah. Yeah. So first with you, Francis, and then uh, maybe over to you, Mara. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I think social death, I defined uh, in my work as basically this perception that, um, that somebody is no longer uh, as connected socially as they used to be. And so it's a perception that they've sort of died before their time. Um, and um, the, the, the words that I heard described is she's not there anymore, or that's, that's not my wife. This is my wife in this photograph. Um, and so social death will come and go, you know, my perception of it's going to be different than uh, Mara's or Sarah's. And, um, but what, what it means is that uh, we have people who essentially die socially before their bodies go. And um, when that happens, um, it's difficult on the people caring for them. It's difficult uh, for everyone involved. And so I think uh, anything that we can do to stave off that social death, I think is, you know, it's, it's, our, it's our social bonds with each other that define us as human beings, I, I believe. And so, we need to make sure that our end of life is supportive of that. And I, I know there was also a question earlier about dementia. And I think that kind of gets into that social death a little bit too. So I know in the Netherlands, um, what they've done to work around dementia, you can have dementia. And I had several people who uh, they weren't full blown Alzheimer's, but they had a level of dementia who were discussing euthanasia with their physician. And the way they do it in the Netherlands, you can get it if you have dementia. Uh, you have to get all your paperwork and all your discussions with the doctor and your written declaration and all that stuff and all, all that preliminary work. You have to get that done before, um, uh, before the dementia goes, progresses too strong, too, too big. Right. But, um, but you can still then get, uh, once you've laid that groundwork, you can get dementia, but I'll tell you what actually happened in practice. That's, that's what the law says. What happens in practice is. Anything that makes a, a Dutch doctor nervous uh, about a euthanasia discussion, that doctor is going to slow things down. They're very big on not saying no outright, but they what they do is they pause it and then they distract and they go do other things. So, what happens is if there's a if there's dementia or if there's a lot of discord in the family or if uh, there's somebody acting in very very not Dutch ways, they basically you know. Put, put things on pause without directly saying that um, because gray areas, they're not as comfortable moving that, you know, through to a euthanasia death. And then the, at that point, you know, the disease might progress enough or the person may change their mind or a family member be, may be very adamant against it. Um, but I think, I think dementia is a kind of an example of a, a social death that it can occur with people. And I think with um, euthanasia and assistance in dying, I think that gets really tricky because if you do want to have a, an assistance assisted death, particularly in the U.S. and there's dementia involved, that means you really have to um, you have to go a lot earlier than I think you would be maybe ready to go. In Holland, at least you can plan that and then go a little later in in your dementia uh, process. So I, I think that gets very tricky. Yeah, if I can experience with that. Yeah, if I can just pick up on that because it it's practically 
um, impossible in the U.S. with the way the laws are written um, for, for someone with dementia to access assisted death because you have to be both mentally competent and have a, a um, terminal prognosis. And at the point at which someone is expected to die, uh, so unless they also had a secondary diagnosis, if, if dementia is going to be the terminal illness, when, when you are expected to die in six months, you are not going to be uh, mentally competent. So you're not gonna be able to make that choice. And we don't permit um, advanced directives for making that choice the way that, that they do in the Netherlands. Um, so, so practically speaking, this is just not an option with the way that the US law is written. Um, to, to go back to the, the social death question, I, I mean, I think it's a really, um, it's an interesting question. And I think the, the person who asked this question was wondering about COVID specifically, because, and I, that's something I've thought uh, a lot about during COVID is, um, is the relationship between social isolation and social death and um, where we have particularly elders in, nursing homes and other kinds of skilled nursing facilities that have been really, really isolated, that just kind of accelerates this social death process. And it's, yeah. it's very difficult and very, very sad. Um, I, I do think that when, uh, that one of the things that people that are interested in medical aid and dying are, are trying to do is to kind of make the social death and the biological death coincide so that they don't have this prolonged social death that precedes their biological death. Um, and I think that we have seen during this time period um, lots more isolation, which doesn't always lead to social death, but I certainly think it can. I think we've also seen a lot of resilience and a lot of kind of creativity and, and ingenuity around navigating that, but, but many of those solutions focus on, um, on technology, which is not accessible to everyone and, and particularly is not always available to older people. So I think it's a real problem. Thank you both. Um, so I wanna turn to um, kind of the, the social support um, elements in Vermont that Mary, you touched upon in your presentation and whether those have changed over time since the time that you've um, done your work, especially regarding um, kind of the access that individuals have, um, both on the provider level, but also on perhaps the pharmacy level of, um, I think I've heard the uh, statistic that there's one dispensing pharmacy in Vermont. And um, this is, you know, within the framework of, we do have ACAMAID, um, the wonderful organization that Monty Shavelson directs. Um, based in California, but provides referral networks to um, main physicians throughout the US. Um, and just wondering whether, you know, throughout, um, since the beginning of your research, Mara, um, and maybe you can speak a little bit to this as well, Francis, of um, really what's changed at all fundamentally, and then um, and go from there. Um. Yeah, I mean, well, it's a little bit hard for me to say what's changed fundamentally in Vermont because I haven't done follow up research there. So, um, so I, I haven't been back to kind of ask about how the conditions have changed on the ground. Um, I, I bet Dr. Shabelson can probably say more from his work with the um, American Clinicians Academy on medical aid and dying. Um, I do think that that the social support piece remains crucial, um, and that comes into play on various levels. But I think um, people tap into their social networks to 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 access this and to plan for this and to sort of uh, I mean, and and that's true not only about planning for death, but also when someone's going through serious illness care as well. Um, and one thing that was kind of interesting to me is that I saw with the people in my study that that support was 
not always provided by family members. And I think that we have a lot of um, concern in the US about the geographic dispersal of families and children living far from their elders. And, and I actually saw that at, at least the people that were um, represented in my study had really robust social support from friend networks as well and often didn't live close to family. And I found that really uh, reassuring and encouraging in the sense that these, these were not people who were choosing assisted death because they didn't have anyone to take care of them. That was just absolutely not the case at all. They had wonderful friends, wonderful supports, and yet still wanted this option. Um, I saw I saw a question just come up in the chat, which I can um, maybe address now, which is about individuals who who might prefer to die alone. And there was one case that a physician told me about of a man who was a veteran and had had a very private life. He had been briefly married, but um, but lived alone and and had no children. And he did want to die alone, and it was actually a little bit complicated um, in part because hospice, it turns out, provides an important role a lot of times in, um, in medical aid and dying because it will be the hospice nurse that will come in to pronounce the death after the person takes the lethal medication. And you, you might arrange that privately with your physician if your physician is willing to do that. Um, but you, if you're planning to take this medication and you're alone, you sort of need to have a, a plan in place for what's going to happen after you die. And the patient that I heard about that wanted to do this alone ended up working out a deal where he was going to put a sign in the window. He like he was maybe going to take the medication on this day, but he wasn't sure if he was actually going to go through with it. And the hospice nurse was going to come by and see if there was some kind of a signal in the window. And so that just kind of shows you how practically um, it's if you want someone to come in and take care of your body and, and have it disposed of properly, you actually need another person. Um, and, and that was the only case that I heard of, of someone wanting to do this alone. And I just wanted to weigh in a little bit about COVID because I feel like COVID has um, really been uh, just a, what a time to live through. I mean, a, a pandemic, I mean, I know, I know there's a whole slew of um, scientists who predicted this, but most of us generally don't think of a pandemic coming through, but what it has done to us socially is pretty extreme. Um, and, you know, not to the mention that we're losing, you know, people that we love um, and, and, and living under the threat of fear of, you know, being taken out and our loved ones being taken out. But I think um, I just wrote a piece with a just an amazing thought leader. Her name's Joanne Lynn, and she does a lot of um, really good work on, you know, where we could take our long term care and our our the social supports uh, around health um, and well being near the end of life to the next level. And so I did a really cool um, sort of back and forth article with her. Um, about COVID and the impact to the long-term care industry and where we might go from here. And uh, I, one of the points I brought out is that COVID seems to be exposing that we're we're in this, a uh, what could be uh, called a crisis period. And the horrible thing about a crisis period is it's not fun, right? It's very dismantling and, um, you know, it's a lot of change and it's a lot of, of um, crisis. Um, so, but what, what is lovely about this is that it's typically followed, um, it, it's before you can get to another level and do things in a very different way, before you can make really big change and not small incremental change, you, you got to have a little bit of a dismantling period, which I think this time may be. And so if we, if, if we can live, think of it as a dismantling time and, and kind of you know, have it expose the cracks in our systems, you know, in MAID not launching. I mean, MAID has been exploding since 2009. You have nine states now that have um, uh, assistance dying laws, even in D.C. And by the way, I rarely hear about it in D.C., so I, I can't imagine if anybody's accessing it yet. Um, but I would love to see us use this time. If, it, if this is a crisis period, let's dream up something way better and let's 
let's put it through, right? So I think now's the time for those dreamers, like Mara's working on this and a, a lot of the people on the call, you know, uh, Lonnie and Tim, they're working on these things. I'm sure there's others. So, you know, let's take this as a call to arms and let's think outside of the box and let's get our health system working with our social supports and working with our your our advocates and let's let's make a way better end of life and i do believe that end of life does not need more things thrown at it it needs to be have less you know less is more at the end of life let's give us space to connect give us supports to stay at home as long as we can you know give us the um the, you know a safe place to live where I've got a grab bar in my bathroom and a, a person I can call if I need someone to come into the home. Let's bring home supports in and, you know, let's, let's get the uh, ACA in a better situation where it's giving us access to just basic health care so that we actually go to the doctor when we're, we're not feeling well. Um, so I, I'd love to see us use this, this time to just get, take this thing to the next level. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're approaching the end of our time today and I, I just wanted to invite concluding comments from both of you. Um, and Francis already touched upon it a bit just now already. Um, but Mara, you mentioned, um, Betsy Davis, who choreographed her own death and mentioned this idea of creating a sacred atmosphere, whether it's more celebratory, kind of like a wedding or. Um, a little more somber, maybe with some ritual elements in the final post, um, but occurring in domestic uh, and non medical settings. And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on how the patients that you've interviewed, um, how these people have created um, their rituals, their sacred spaces, and what sources they've drawn upon for inspiration and support and comfort. Um, and so I welcome your thoughts. Sure, and I'd love to hear Francis's response to this too. But I, I think people really, um, this has been said in in this session and and in other kinds of um, sessions on end of life care. But people die as they live or strive to die as they live, and so I think often what people are looking for is a continuity with their life as lived. Um, so it how that actually gets operationalized. I mean, I think it it might mean being in a particular place, being at home and in a room that is meaningful to you. It I think really important is the question of who will be with you, right? And and so whether that is family members, friends, um, many people, just a couple of people. Um, I think this is honestly why healthcare providers don't always get invited because if there is a really close relationship with a physician or nurse then that can be really meaningful and supportive but um but if one doesn't have that kind of relationship with their healthcare providers they might not want that person present so it really de depends on the nature of the illness um and then from there you know it it depends on what matters to them so I, the the story that i read about renee she wanted to wear a crazy leopard print outfit when she died. Um, another woman that I heard about wanted to wear also a crazy outfit because she thought it would make her sons laugh. And she wore very silly socks and a, a, like a very silly top that she hadn't worn in a long time. Um, there's often attention to uh, concern about, about the mess that can accompany dying, right? So people wearing diapers. Um, or people opting to be in a particular location. There was one uh, person who, whose death I heard about who actually died sitting up um, on a couch kind of with his arm like this. He wasn't lying down and his friend just found that so comical and so surprising that he didn't wanna get into bed. And it, but it was just very much in keeping with, with how he lived. Um, so yeah, those are those are just some of the the examples that spring to mind. Yeah, and I and I can um I just you know, the we were so it was so wonderful to be able to sit with people who would give you 
when they're in their last week or last day to give you even a minute of their time was such an honor. Um, and so, you know, I know Mara feels that and I, I definitely felt that I, I would just want to share some of the gems, the beautiful things that people gave me while, you know, in their last moments. And, um, you know, one was basically, you know, I asked people what mattered at the end of life and they didn't talk about money and they didn't talk about accomplishing, you know, goals in life. They, all of them, every single one would talk about their relationships. They talk about the ones that went really well and mattered so much to them and the ones, and there'd usually sometimes be one relationship that didn't go so well. And they talk about their regrets about not just patching it up. So I think that's a beautiful gift that we can take and share with all of our loved ones. Um, and when I came back after 15 months of sitting with people who were dying, and then I had my mother die at the end of it, I learned very clearly that if I, if I love someone, don't wait to say it, just let people know that you'll love them every day. And, uh, and really end of life is really about how you live well now, you know, and, uh, the best we can do is, you know, every day try to be kind and lovely and, um, and connect and let the, let our loved ones know that we love them. So end of life is just about living in my opinion. What a beautiful way to phrase it. What a beautiful message. Thank you both so very much. It's been a true honor uh, to sit here with you today um, and listen to your wisdom, your expertise. Um, I'm just deep gratitude to both of you for, for being here today and for um, teaching our Completed Life audience more about the incredible work that you do. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience and to everyone watching back the recording um, or tuning in today. It's been a delight to have your questions come in and um, we'll look forward to staying in touch further as we go through the uh, second annual Completed Life Fall Conference. Um, I just want to share a brief note about next session. Session two will be looking at the narrative overview of the right to die movement in the United States, featuring our very own Dr. Timothy Quill and uh, Professor Thaddeus M. Pope, um, exploring those tensions um, in the legal uh, roadmap of the right to die. So um, please uh, tune in for that. We look forward to welcoming you back for session two on Tuesday, November 9th, uh, same time, same place, via Cisco WebEx, at starting at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, thank you all so much again, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, be well, and uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.